we're going to be talking about questions. And I'm going to guess that some of you may have a question already. How did I get the name Stormy? Yeah. <laughs> How did I know? When I was a little girl, my dad loved horses. He loved everything about horses. He raised horses, he trained horses, he raced them, he showed them. And he was aware of a children's book. And it was about Stormy the horse. And I am named for that children's book character. <laughs> And the thing that's interesting about the character in this book is Stormy was a thoroughbred horse that wasn't cut out for racing and then found his purpose in, as a polo pony. And I kind of think that's interesting because we start out with questions about what our purpose is and where we are in life. And that answer is already there. So today, we are going to talk about three questions because questions are a natural element of our conversations. They reveal information and they focus attention. And questions also show our natural inquisitiveness about what's going on around us and how we fit into the picture. Asking the right question or set of questions can help us develop a strategy or a plan for action. In my experience as a reporter, a simple question could take a really mundane interview in a completely different direction. When new information is revealed, it can give us a whole new focus on events and situations. Today, we're going to focus on a relationship, one relationship. You know, today we have lots of relationships, don't we? People want to have a relationship with their banker, a relationship with their auto mechanic, a relationship with the grocery checkout clerk. But there's really just one relationship in life, and that's our relationship with God. Well, today we're going to focus on three simple questions. Why would you have a relationship with God? The second question is, how do we recognize our relationship with God? And our third question is, what can we expect from this relationship? These are really good questions to consider whether you've been exploring your relationship with God for a while or if you're just beginning to consider it. Well, let's start with that first question. Why would you have a relationship with God? Well, to answer this question, let's talk about peas. When I was a little kid, I did not like peas. And my mother loved them, so they were often on the menu at dinner. And every time the scene played out the same way, dinner would be done. All the table dishes would be cleared, except for me. I would be sitting there staring at the peas on my plate. Well, my dad would be there sitting, reading the newspaper. So I had to figure out what I was going to do with those peas. What I did was very, very quietly and very slowly, I would take a few peas off the plate. But I had to be very careful because my dad, every once in a while, wanted to check on the progress. And he would look out from behind his newspaper. Well, I had to look like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. So I would take those peas and very, very quietly and very, very carefully hand them to the dog who was waiting very expectantly under the table. Well, finally, my plate would be cleared. The meal would be done, I would be excused, everything was fine. Well, like most children, I was instructed by my parents that if I ever was eating dinner at a friend's house, I was to eat everything on the plate, whether I liked it or not, without comment. This one, this is great. It seemed like none of my friends' families liked peas until that one day. 
So I was sitting there at the table and there comes my plate and on it was peas. Well, I ate all around the peas and then I got to that point where I just couldn't avoid them any longer. So I took a bite of peas. They were delicious. <laughs> where had peas been all my life? Well, they were right there on my plate, right in front of me. But I had a preconceived idea that I wasn't going to like them, so I wouldn't even try them. Well, sometimes people are that way about God. He's right here all the time. We just don't notice. Or we have a preconceived idea about what God is. And sometimes it's hard to figure out why we should have a connection with God. After all, there are lots of self-help books and programs available. Lots of plans for setting goals and achieving them. Lots of motivational speakers. But all of these avenues require us to buy someone else's plan and follow it. But each of us is unique with our own gifts and our own plan. Listening to God comes really easily to some folks. Some folks need a nudge, maybe even a big push, and that would be me. As I was growing up, if anyone had told me that I would be speaking with you about Christian science, I would have laughed. It is not the life path I would have ever envisioned for myself. Yep, I grew up in Christian science and I attended Christian Science Sunday School. But as I walked out of my high school graduation, I was thinking, yippee, I never have to set foot in a church again. All I wanted to do was have fun, and I did. I was drifting along aimlessly, and I knew it. I had no anchor. I was convinced I didn't need God to be a good person or a spiritual person. Well, can you guess what happened when things kind of weren't going so well? Well, of course, I would pray and ask God for help. And usually it was along the lines of, Dear God, help me out of this jam, and I promise I will turn my life around. Of course, I never followed through on my end of the bargain. Even when I was sure and I knew that God had helped me. Well, when I was about 21, I was having a great time. And to me, that meant playing about nine holes of golf in the morning, attending a couple of summer school classes, and topped off the day with a few sets of tennis. I went to bed at night, expecting to do it all over again the next day. Well, one day, things didn't go according to that plan. I went to sleep that night, and I didn't wake up for three days. When I finally did wake up, I couldn't walk or move my arms, and staying conscious for very long was next to impossible. During that time, my parents realized something was very wrong. So they made two phone calls. They called a Christian science practitioner to pray with them because they needed support and comfort. Christian science practitioners, by the way, are available to pray with anyone about any situation that they may be facing. And Christian science is the practical utilization of the laws of God through prayer to heal just as Jesus did and taught. And the practice of Christian science has a century long track record of healing so folks like my parents trusted it for their every need. And when I was growing up, I had experienced consistent health and healing through Christian science. 
But my parents realized I was on a different path. So my mom called her best friend, a Christian scientist, and her husband, a doctor, and asked if the husband would come and attend to me. Well, Doc, as we called him, came out to our house and examined me. He ran a few tests, but it was with great sadness that he told my folks that I was very ill. He couldn't give an exact diagnosis, but it was obvious to him that I was failing and Doc was not at all sure I would survive. Over the next few months, I visited two more doctors who confirmed what Doc had said. They were more specific. They said I would never walk again and that I didn't have long to live. Well, in my waking moments, I prayed. I prayed to die. I figured that whatever came after death had to be better than where I was at that moment. The pain was intense. Doc offered painkillers, but I felt I wanted a very clear head to be very direct with God, to make sure I was getting through to him about what I wanted. I kept wondering why God didn't answer my prayer. After all, I knew what I wanted. I wanted my old life back or death. Each day when I awakened and I discovered I was still here and the pain was as intense as ever, I was angry, very angry with God. Why wasn't he answering my prayer? Hmm. Days passed, weeks passed, about three months passed. I noticed something. All those friends I played golf with, played tennis with, went to school with, all of what I thought were meaningful relationships, not one of them called, reached out to me to find out where I had disappeared to. It was at that moment I realized that life had changed forever. I realized some really important points. No one was going to be able to solve my problem for me. What I needed, my dad couldn't buy for me. My mom couldn't make for me. And my friends couldn't do it for me either. I knew this problem wasn't going to disappear, but I knew I didn't want to be a victim. I knew I needed bigger help. I needed God. Well, that realization brings us to our second question. How do we recognize our relationship with God? All my life, I had heard about healings people had experienced by turning to God for help. I had experienced them as well. I couldn't understand why God wasn't helping me. It dawned on me, if you want to get to know someone, you find out about them. You get to know what it is that, that, that they're about. You learn about them. You focus on them. Well, let's think about those peas again. When I go to the grocery store to buy peas, I know what I want. I walk into the grocery store. I walk past the bakery. I walk past the meat department. I head for the frozen food aisle because I know that's where I'm going to find those peas that I want. I go down the aisle. I go right past the ice cream, <laughs> past the breakfast entrees, and I head for the frozen vegetables. Now, I don't look at the broccoli. I don't look at the green beans. While those are green vegetables, those aren't peas. 
I don't look at the corn and pick it up and go, oh my gosh, look at that. There's white corn and there's yellow corn. Ah, I wonder how many kernels of corn are in the package. I don't do that. I know that I want peas. I reach into the case and I get the frozen peas that I want. I know what I want and I get it. Well, in this situation, I found myself in failing health. I realized I didn't want to be a victim and I had faith that there was an applicable solution. The only method I could think of was God because other methods couldn't offer the aid I needed. I understood that I needed to learn how to focus on God, about his presence, his power. I was stuck in a wheelchair. How was I going to do that? Well, I decided to start by reading the Bible from cover to cover. Well, my mom helped me find a Bible that I could hold all by myself, and I could turn the pages on my own. But it seemed like a daunting project. Well, then I opened the Bible to the very first book, which is Genesis. And I started right with that very first chapter. To me, it was a beautiful picture. And it's a picture that I still see today because it's a transformation from darkness and chaos to light, orderliness, and peace. The word good is used in this chapter, just 31 verses in this chapter of the Bible. It's used seven times. Well, I'll share this one thing with you because it, it meant a lot to me. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Well, right there in that very first chapter, I learned something very important. God already had a relationship with me. In other words, I began to feel inseparable from God. I could feel God as the source of my being. In that realization, I understood that God is not superhuman, but ever-present, all-intelligent, supremely powerful spirit. And as God's own image and likeness, I was spiritual. Well, as you may know, the second chapter of Genesis gives an entirely different account of creation. Maybe many of you know it. It's Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. It's where the serpent entices Eve into eating the forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And she coaxes Adam into joining her well, God had given some very precise instructions. It was, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Well, to me that says, Know me God alone. Don't look for an opposite. But they did it anyway. If Adam and Eve had listened to the ultimate authority, God, what to do about the serpent, well, they wouldn't have been fooled into thinking that knowing evil is essential for understanding God, or that obeying God is optional. Well, we do the same thing all the time 
without thinking. We think, oh, I can handle that problem or I see the answer. I'll give you an example. When I was in school, I worked in my dad's engineering company. I had a variety of jobs doing this. I was not only the receptionist, but I also helped out in the office. I was in charge of some of the office managing. I had to type contracts. I had to be aware of them. And I also had to keep track of all of the technical drawings that were in a lot of file cabinets. I had to be able to locate them and pull them out on a moment's notice. But I had to learn a very important lesson. Just because I was the boss's daughter didn't mean that I could speak for my father. A lot of times people would come to the door. People that had legitimate business, I was supposed to bring them in and show them where they were supposed to be. But sometimes people would come to the office door that had no legitimate business there. Well, my only job was to turn them away. I didn't need to know where they came from. I didn't need to know what it was they wanted. I didn't need to know how long they had been standing there. My only responsibility was to turn them away. But if there was a question, my dad was right there to make a final decision. I was in middle management and I had to learn what that meant. Well, if we think about it this way, our life is like business. We must always look to that higher authority. We need to turn our lives over to God. If Adam and Eve had realized they were in middle management, <laughs> perhaps they would have handled things differently. Well, when hatred, fear, anxiety, anger, frustration, lack, knock at the door of thought. That's actually serpent-like thought knocking. It distracts us. Think about it this way. Have you ever gone to the grocery store for one item? And you know what that one item is. And you walk into the grocery store and they're, oh, they just got done baking bread and it smells so good. So you get that fresh baked bread. And then, oh, you know, they're having a sale on paper products. So you load up with those things and you're, oh, well, you know, while I'm here, I should get, I don't know, apples, whatever. And what do you do? You get home with three bags of groceries and realize you don't have the one item you went to get in the first place. Well, that's how that distraction works. It's the same thing when it comes to our problems. If we're not careful, we can spend a lot of time trying to figure our problems out. We want to know where they came from, why they came, whose fault it is they showed up, how big they are, how long they'll stick around, and how bad they are. Well, those are the wrong questions. We need to focus on God. Our job is to be alert and turn them away because they have no legitimate business in our lives. We should act like middle managers and turn the whole business over to God. After all, he is ever present, all intelligent, and supremely powerful. Jesus stated it so well. He said, God, your Father, knows your needs before you ask him. There is such power in that statement. Power over ego, self-logic, self-will, and personal insight. And it gives all power to God. Jesus' statement recognizes God not as the source of the problem, but the ever-present solution. Jesus walked the earth more than 2,000 years ago, and what he taught is still teaching us today. 
He didn't have to discover his relationship with God. He was the Son. Jesus gave us the way to see and understand our relationship with God in order to experience peace and health through this relationship, which we understand as the Christ. To Christians, he is the Savior whose example we can follow to find peace and health, the Christ, which is the presence and activity of God. Jesus lived Christ and taught Christ. A good way to think of it is this way. Christ is that indestructible connecting link that allows us to feel our oneness with God. It brings enlightenment to consciousness and healing to the body. Christ is still here today. That healing and saving power is just as present now as it was during Jesus' lifetime. I felt the healing touch of the Christ as I realized these things. The illness was less and less impressive to me. As I sat in my wheelchair, I realized I no longer needed to ask God to return me to my old life or show me how to die. I realized I had been asking the wrong question. My prayer became, Father, Mother, God, show me how to lay down more of my plans and opinions and trust you to show me the path of my life. Well, by this time, I was getting stronger, and my folks thought it was a good idea for me to get out of the house. So they approached me about returning to college. That was a big step. How would I cope? I was in a wheelchair. There were no accommodations for disabled students. There were few elevators. There were no special doors. There was no one who would be able to help me or guide me. I would have to move from one place to another without any means of assistance. But I thought, wow, here's a great opportunity to apply what I had been learning about my relationship with God. Well, it was about a 40, 45 minute drive from our home to school. And my dad drove me to school on the two days that I had classes. My dad and I like to talk about a lot of different things, but we had a very specific agenda during our trip. We usually like to talk about politics, sports, the weather, different goings on, books we had been reading, but we decided that we had to have a very specific purpose during this time. So we set it aside to spend that opportunity to share what we both had been learning from reading the Bible, the inspiration that we had found, the guidance we had found, and knowing that that was applicable in this particular adventure. So that first day, my dad drove me to school, got me out of the car, got my wheelchair, got me settled, wheeled me up to my class, and then he turned around and walked away. He didn't even say goodbye. And I thought, okay, it was wonderful. I loved being around my contemporaries. I loved being back in school. I loved the opportunity to learn. The class time flew by. And then I had to get from that one class to my next class. Well, at that time, Wheelchairs were really unwieldy pieces of equipment. They were large, they were heavy, they were hard to roll. I may have been struggling a little bit, but someone in the class noticed and he came over and he said, can I give you a hand? Well, I was certainly grateful for it. He was a young medical student 
And he was interested in seeing and understanding the situation I was in. And he enjoyed watching how this healing unfolded. But at this particular point, he helped me get from one class to the next class. He helped me get from that class back out to meet my dad. And that became a routine. He would get there early and help me in each class that I went to. Well, right there, in those very simple things, I recognized that God was caring for me, shepherding me, and supplying my need. At home, I continued studying the Bible and Jesus' life, teaching, and works. In fact, over the course of this experience, I read the Bible all the way through, cover to cover, three or four times. I also began reading this book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures by Mary Baker Eddy. It was her constant study of the Bible that led her to the discovery of Christian science. She wrote this book using the Bible as her only guide and authority. And she proved it. Through her life experiences, she proved that we can heal just as Jesus did. And she wrote down that discovery in the book. It gives a, a framework for understanding God, his creation, and the vital relationship between the two. It is a textbook and a workbook to help us recognize our relationship to God as his precious creation. You now it's interesting, right in the preface of the book, she dedicates it to honest seekers for truth. And I certainly fell into that category. I wanted to find a way to see this problem solved. And she mentions Jesus in this book hundreds of times. In fact, she makes this observation about Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth taught and demonstrated man's oneness with the Father. And for this, we owe him endless homage. His mission was both individual and collective. He did life's work aright, not only in justice to himself, but in mercy to mortals, to show them how to do theirs, but not to do it for them nor to relieve them of a single responsibility. <laughs> it suddenly dawned on me that the progress I had been making was because I had taken responsibility for my relationship with God. No one, no one could have my relationship with God for me. And it is the most important relationship I could have. But relationships depend on communication. And our relationship with God is no different. Prayer is that precious communication that opens the heart, the soul, the mind to God, to God's loving presence. You see, I had been trying to find the right words in the Bible to get God's attention, the right things to quote to him so that he would pay attention. Well, what I learned was that I needed to be grateful for his presence and listening for his direction. I really liked the way Mary Baker Eddy described prayer right in the first chapter. She says, in order to pray aright, we must enter into the closet and shut the door. We must close the lips and silence the material senses. Well, to me, those words echoed and illustrated Jesus' words that describe prayer. He said, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, Pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee 
openly. So, I began developing a prayer practice of quiet listening. My desire was to see the practical application of this understanding of God. Well, I was rewarded openly. Soon, I could stand and walk with crutches. In fact, I was strong enough that my dad thought that I should try skiing. Well, a little explanation there. What my parents noticed was that I had become sort of complacent, that I wasn't really demanding of myself, that I needed to be a little more active in really de demonstrating God's love for me. So they said, why not try it? You can imagine, we went to a, it was right before Christmas, and as you can imagine, there was a little bit of uh, surprise on the ski shop man's face when I walked in there with crutches and my folks bought me new skis, new bindings, new boots and poles and said, yes, she's going skiing. Well, my dad drove me up to a small ski area near our home and he had paid the owner of the area and the staff to help me. So we arrived and a ski instructor came over and helped me get on my boots helped me put on the skis. My dad took my crutches and gave me my ski poles. And off I went with the ski instructor, using my poles more as crutches and making my way to the ski lift. Well, what they did is they slowed down the lift so that I could get on. Ah, it was such a wonderful feeling. You see, I had skied from the time I was a little kid. So to get on this ski lift, it was just such freedom to me. There we were, we went up, up the mountain, and they slowed down the lift again so that I could get off. Oh, it was beautiful. I just, oh, I was just so happy to be there. And I started off skiing. I started off at the top, I skied down one way, I came around, and I fell. Well, I was really afraid at this point because I was afraid that the progress I had been making might be lost. Well, that was contrary though to what I had been learning from God about the strength, vitality, and functionality of my being. And I recognized this is a change of thought for me. Instead of seeing myself in terms of a physical body that needed fixing, I could see and feel I was an idea of divine spirit and my being is totally spiritual. Well, I did what came naturally. I reached out to God in prayer and it was a very quick prayer. First, I calmed myself by reminding myself that God is good and an ever-present help in trouble and then I continued. God created all and was the supreme law of life. He couldn't create something unlike himself. He couldn't make me a victim of illness or a broken being. He made me full of life. He was the source of my strength. Well, I waited for just a moment and I could feel that there had been wonderful healing. I turned to the ski instructor, knowing that my prayer had been answered, and asked her if she would help me get up. And she said no. <laughs> she had already called the ski patrol. They were coming along with a sled to load me up and carry me down the mountain. I could see them coming, and I begged her to help me get up. And finally, she told me it was against her better judgment, but she did help me get up and I skied away. It must have been quite a parade because there I was skiing along with the ski instructor behind me with the ski patrol right behind her following me down the mountain. So I continued skiing all the way down to the bottom where I met my dad. He was standing there with my crutches, but I didn't need them again. From that point onward, I walked normally. I was completely healed. 
And the next winter, I was working at that ski, in, ski area as an instructor. What I experienced was healing by spiritual means alone. Well, let's take a moment to consider what happened because this came as I recognized my relationship with God. Through my study of the Bible and science and health with key to, to the scriptures, I was developing my understanding of God, his creation, and the precious relationship between the two. This study was also developing and strengthening my prayer practice from the grocery list approach to prayer. Do you know what that is? That's where we sit there and we go, okay, God, what I need is a new car, a new job. Yeah, I need to have this little conflict over here taken care of. I need to do this. How are you going to answer my prayer? Hmm. It didn't work to say, this is what I want. Give it to me. I realized I needed to recognize God's goodness and the evidence of that goodness in my life. This alleviated the fear that God had abandoned me and helped me develop the trust that God is active, ever-present, all-intelligent, and supremely powerful spirit. So here we are at question three. What can we expect from this relationship? Peace of mind, health, direction in life, the ability to experience positive change in our lives. Well, that's what we would call healing. The Bible is full of accounts of healing. There are hundreds of physical healings recorded in the Bible. My healing didn't seem like a miracle to me. It was the natural change that occurred as I was finding my relationship with God. Actually, that relationship was there all along, and that's true for all of us. The healing was the result of that relationship being made known or discovered. What amazed me was that the writings of a 19th century woman held their power to help someone like me a hundred years later. Mary Baker Eddy was not a theologian, not an intellectual. It was her study of the Bible that brought healing, not just some feel-good quotes to endure life. Mary Baker Eddy was very much like the women of her era. The expectation was to be a wife, a mother, and a homemaker. Hmm. But Mary Baker Eddy rose from widowhood, single motherhood, divorce, limitation, poverty, to be an author and the founder of a worldwide church. In 1891, Mary Baker Eddy published her autobiography it's called Retrospection and Introspection. And she leads the reader through a narration of her life, not as a rise from victim to success, but how God was revealing to her the truth of life. For instance, she begins with her ancestors, but she doesn't credit good genes or some cultural inheritance for her discovery. It was her love of God. And she writes about her family. For many people, family is the cradle of their feelings about themselves. But she didn't accept the limitations placed on her by her family. They saw her as sickly and incapable of taking care of herself or her child. Well, what she learned is that security, a stable home, or a happy family life, that those are the result of practical spiritual understanding, 
That spiritual understanding is seeing the relationship between God and creation as active now. Well, she searched for health. She learned that health didn't come from water treatments, hygienic treatments, or special diets. Although she tried them all, what she did find is that health comes from divine mind, the very consciousness and presence of God. Instead of feeling like a, a victim of circumstances, Mrs. Eddy saw that every step of the way, she was being led by God to lean on him. She writes that our happiness, the very core of our being, is not dependent on persons, places, or things. It does depend on our understanding of God as infinite love, life, and mind. Those are terms that she uses to identify the vastness, the infinity of God. She found that by humbly listening and obediently following God's direction, she could heal herself, she could heal others, and she could teach them how to heal as well. And she called this discovery Christian science. She proved that Jesus' teachings and healings were more than supernatural occurrences limited to that particular time. Well, most good relationships, though, require dedication to keep them satisfying and fulfilling. And our relationship with God is similar. It takes attention, devotion, and diligence to understand our inseparability from truth and love. One great healing can send us on the path with God, but we must keep our connection fresh, vital, and active by making it a habit to turn to God, to divine truth, every day for our every need. I trained as a chef, so I tend to think of things in terms of cooking. The ingredients that we use and the techniques we follow make cooking a science because it has a proven outcome. If you pull out a recipe for brownies and follow it exactly, the result is going to be brownies, not a roast turkey. Well, turning to God for help helps you find the right ingredients for your relationship with him. It's not a theory or an experiment. Your relationship with God is absolute, inseparable, provable in every circumstance. As we nurture that love of God and feeling his love for us, we can expect that consciousness of his presence and the evidence of his love. That's the Christ, active and present now. It brings peace and joy to life. It also brings immediate help, safety, in the face of danger. One spring, my husband, two children, and I were driving home to upstate New York from vacation in Florida. It was late in the afternoon, and it had been a long day of travel. We didn't realize that we were on a pretty remote section of highway, and we really didn't think about it when we pulled into the rest area. There was one other vehicle in the parking lot, and we didn't notice that we pulled in and parked right next to it. Well, our children did something they never did. They unclipped themselves from their seat belts, jumped out of the car, and headed for the green grass. Well, as they did that, two men jumped out of the van. My husband and I got out of the car. They got between us, and they were trying to talk to us. They were asking really crazy questions. 
but I just followed my husband's lead, made sure the car doors were closed, my husband locked the door, and we walked away. We scooped up our kids, we walked up a hill to a pavilion where the restrooms were. The boys went in the men's room, my daughter and I went in the women's room. Boy, did I reach out to God in prayer. The only thing that I could come to mind was, dear God, I am so scared. And there was an answer. It was a line from a poem some of you may be familiar with. It was, Father, where thine own children are, I love to be. Just paused for a moment and I realized that whatever was going on, those men were just as much ideas and children of God as my husband and two children and I. And I could trust God on that. I could trust God that he was in control of the situation. Well, I know my husband had been praying as well. And we met outside and we walked to a spot where the men down by our car couldn't see us, but we could see them. And by now, the van door was open and it appeared they were talking with someone else inside the van. And they were walking around our car with a baseball bat. We stood there very quietly. We didn't say anything, but we just kept knowing that there was an applicable solution that would bring goodness to all. And we stood there. And it seemed like a really long time. But we just stood there quietly. And our children stood there quietly. We just waited. And suddenly a caravan of cars came into the parking lot. They parked sort of adjacent to us. A lot of people, they all jumped out of their cars. They were so happy to see one another. They were just talking and laughing. And the men looked around, they jumped in their van, and they took off. We were able to walk down, put our children in the car, and continue on our journey. Very grateful to know that God was taking care of everyone, each one of us. Well, sometimes it feels like we have been facing the same problem for years. Sometimes it doesn't seem like it's that immediate answer and that immediate manifestation of that goodness. Sometimes, as I look at it, it's like pot scrubbing. I have a favorite stock pot that I use a lot. And one time I was trying out a new recipe and I burnt the daylights out of it. In fact, in the bottom of that pot was about half, three quarters of an inch of solid gunk. Hmm. Well, sometimes people would say, just throw it out and start again. Or the other answer is maybe to scrub it. But the problem with scrubbing it is that it wrecks the interior of the pot and it can render it useless. So I didn't think that was gonna work. I did a little bit of research and I thought, okay, I found a method that involved boiling a uh, cleanser in the pot and then letting it sit and then boiling something else in the pot and letting it sit. Several step process. I did it. Nothing happened. And I thought, well, okay, I'll try it again. Followed the process again. Oh, this time a little bit of that gunk rinsed out. Thought, okay, I kept doing it again. A little more gunk out of the pot. Finally, I realized that all of the gunk was lifted out of the pot. The finish on the inside of the pot was restored like it was brand new and shiny, ready to go. It was great. Well, that's the way it is with prayer. Sometimes we think nothing is going on. But it is. Every time there's that little bit of gunk that is lifted. 
It's as we turn to our Father, Mother, God, we are enfolded in divine love. Sometimes the transformation is quick, like being in the parking lot. Sometimes we don't recognize it right away, but it is there. It is seeing and feeling that conscious connection with God. That's our normal state of being. That's what we can expect from our relationship with God. Well, remember our three questions? Why would you have a relationship with God? We all need bigger help, help we can depend on. It offers peace of mind that approaches every situation with the assurance there is an applicable solution that will bring goodness to all. Here's an important point though. Know that you are worthy of a loving relationship with God because he already loves you. If you feel like you've crossed a line of separation from God or are no longer worthy of his love by action or circumstance, God will guide you back home. Our second question, how do we recognize our relationship with God? By learning to see the ever presence of love, the vitality of life and the activity of truth and realizing that these are all components of God good. One other thing, this book, Science and Health, can help. Read it and find out and utilize the benefits of your relationship with God. What can you expect from this relationship? Joy and peace, transformation, the grand adventure of life. Remember, all it took for me was one actual taste of peas to find out how good they are. My preconceptions vanished. And in the same way, one step toward God eliminates our preconceptions about him and brings us the banquet of a lifetime. You are the only one that can have your relationship with God. It is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.